Oh, yeah, I do need to turn my camera on, huh? So welcome back, guys. This is Andy with the Poor Pearls Almanac, the Poor Pearls Twitch, the Skillshare, whatever you want to call it. Today, we are talking about making wine, mead, making taking calories and making them storable with fermentation and uh, I, ideally making it also taste good because that that's kind of nice sometimes, too. So if you're joining us, please jump in the chat, say hi. There's some folks right now watching on Instagram as I'm holding my phone up like some crazy maniac at my camera. And um, I, I definitely would say if you're watching on Instagram and you want to learn more about wine and mead making, I'm about to turn it off. So come join us on the other side on Twitch, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, all those good things. Um, so, yeah, let's get this party started. So let me introduce our guest today, Aiden. So come on, come on and uh, say hi. Hi, how's it going? Good. So uh, before we get going, uh, what what got you into wine and mead making? So um, when I was 18, I decided to go to school for uh, microbiology. And um, I was doing that for about two years. I dropped out of college due to some personal reasons. And uh, I wanted to pick up a hobby that was kind of in the same vein as like microbiology. And my roommate at the time was like, oh, we should try meat making. It's super easy. You can't mess it up. And of course, I messed up my first batches. Um, but I wasn't super deterred. I kept on trying and I kept on working towards it. Um, and then I found out that there was a wine program here in Arizona. So I... Um, kind of put myself through wine school more or less um and uh that was about three yeah about three years ago three or four awesome. years ago so. so so i also made wine in college but it was a little bit different i got the concentrated grape juice put it in a gallon jug and put a condom on the top yeah popped a little hole in the top and uh yeah th there was a running gag about that for a while but it was it was it, actually honestly it was terrible it was not good it was the worst thing i've ever drank in my life yep at the time uh there were bets on whether or not people were going to go blind so i would not recommend doing it it technically turns into alcohol yeah uh, no, it technically <laughs> is drinkable but whether or not you want to drink it is a completely different story yeah um it, it becomes a challenge to see who can actually drink any of it but um yeah so like i my it's funny if, because I did that and like looking back, it seems so silly, but also like my, uh, my grandfather was a, a, a wine. Well, he owned, managed uh, a, a small vineyard in Italy before he came to the U S and then mm -hmm. he would press his own grapes and all that stuff growing up. Like most immigrants that are from the Mediterranean do. And um, that was still like kind of disconnected from me. And then as I got older, I kind of learned to really appreciate uh, the, that exposure that I had. And um, it's something that now as my career is too far gone to make any changes, but it's definitely something that I think is of interest and um, it's something I definitely want to learn more about. So I'm happy to uh, find out how to make more than just the, the box of wine that you can get at the kit. Um, I've got some uh, grapes going that I'm hoping in a couple of years will uh, be able to produce enough fruit to actually try to make like a real wine out of. Right. Yeah, no, um, it's... Uh... You know, my schooling, I learned a lot about like European uh, winemaking customs and all of the the finer um, like laws. Like there's, there's so many just finicky, fine laws about like what you can put on a bottle and um, kind of how the grapes are all sourced and uh, how co-ops and small families kind of come together and, and make a kind of collective wine out of these like small one acre half acre lots of of uh, wine grapes it's 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 really it's really cool yeah yeah the 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 concept of like an estate wine or the terroir of the, mm -hmm. the land is really like something that's like I, I think speaks really intimately to people when they you spend so much time outdoors to be like this is the flavor of this place mm -hmm. um yeah, in a way I, that like you totally don't agree. really get with like beer or a lot of a lot of uh, fermented foods mm -hmm. um and that's where wine i think kind of really stands out and it's just cool yeah no um i think that's a, a big problem with like the meat industry right now is they're too it's still too much of a gimmick uh there's too much theming around like vikings and medieval and D, D, 
and uh, there's not really anyone trying to tell a story about their metery or their bees. It's always this kind of gimmick. And yeah, I, I think eventually, probably like the next 10 years, they'll probably be more uh, more serious uh, kind of ventures into mead making. And you'll have um, you'll, you'll have people wanting to tell a story about what's in the bottle instead of just what's on the label. Yeah. And you're, you're starting to see that in craft beer. Um, mm -hmm. A good friend of mine uh, was a sales manager for a fairly decent sized uh, craft brewery. And um, one of the things you're starting to see here in New England, I'm, I'm not sure about outside of New England, but you're starting to see this idea of like the farm to table merging with the craft beer industry. Mm -hmm. And then it's becoming uh, like you're starting to see these really early stages of like estate style beers where it's like all the major ingredients for this beer are grown on site. And um, it may be a super limited run, but just the, the idea, it's kind of merging those two different worlds of like mm -hmm. the craft beer industry and then that very uh, localized wine industry. Right. So um, I, I could talk about this stuff for a long time. So we should probably actually talk about what we're here to talk about, which is how do we actually do all this stuff? Right. So uh, where do you want to start? So um, I think the best way to start would be um, kind of what you need. Um, cause from there we can kind of jump around to, uh, you know, how to make it, but first we got to kind of go over the equipment. So, um, the, uh, so my first batches, I made one gallon batches of mead. Um, you, I mean, you, you can do mead pretty, or you can do most, uh, fermentation pretty low key. Uh, I've seen people do like two liter bottles and balloons, like college style stuff. Um, and when I was doing it for my first run, I did just like a, a little, um, I did a bunch of one gallon uh, uh, carboys. And I, it, it, it's both a blessing and a curse because those first batches were really bad and I'm glad I didn't have a whole lot of it. Um, but I feel like if you're going to get into it, you're better off doing a better or, or doing uh, a little bit more production. So I would recommend, um, the first thing I recommend always is get yourself a bucket. Um, you can go down to Lowe's or, um, wherever you can get like a food grade bucket. Uh, you can get a pretty, uh, pretty cheap. They're like five bucks with a lid. Um, Tractor supply the sells them too. Yeah, tractor supply. Uh, your local brew store will have them. Um, they're 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 pretty easy to come by. Um, you just got to drill a hole in the lid uh, that can fit a five eighths um, kind of airlock grommet. And if you look on like more beer or uh, any of the other kind of like specialized brewing sites, uh, and just look up like fermentation grommet, they'll they'll pop up, and they're cheap. They're like fifty cents. Um, I would then recommend, so I, that's your five gallon bucket. Uh, I would then recommend a carboy. So the bucket's just going to get you through fermentation. The carboy is going to be what you store it and age it in. So I actually have, this guy is a, a three gallon um, carboy. Uh, that's about as small as I'd recommend um, unless you're doing, so my first batches were one gallons. I'm up to doing like 10 gallon batches now. Um, I have big nine gallon Demi Johns, um, which are really, really expensive. Um, and uh, I have like these, um, these blue uh, drums, like the, like, you know, like the water drums kind of. Yeah, I have a I have like a fourteen gallon one uh, that I've kind of customized so that I could do my big ten gallon batches now, um, but obviously that's not necessary when you get like started first off. This is like down the down the road. Um, by you having like a three gallon uh, carboy, it lets you you have a little bit more control over over your mead or your wine or whatever you're 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 fermenting. Um, you have a better time controlling temperature. You have a better time controlling, uh, the other kind of like your nutrients, your acid, uh, the, the different factors that go into what's going on in your, in, in your carboy. Um, 
And the other thing is, let's say that your first one or your second one's really, really good. And you're doing a one gallon batch instead of a, a three gallon or a five gallon or a 10 gallon. Um, you're going to really regret not having more of it. Uh, the first time I won an award for my mead, I only had two cases of it and it, it was gone like in four months. And I regret that so bad because it was so tasty. And then I had another one that won that was a 10 gallon batch that was, you know, um, like four or five cases and that's all gone now. So now I need to increase my production more because uh, I actually like what I produce. So yeah, that's a fun stage when you get there, uh, when it doesn't taste like something like that that yeasty flavor. That, or yeah, jet fuel. Yeah, or yeah. even just like that yeasty. Like this is like you can quantify in the flavor profile that it's made in someone's basement. Uh, right. Even if it's like pretty good, it still like has that that off flavoring of yeast usually. Uh, right. Once once you get past that, you're like, oh, I'm making like real alcohol, beer, wine, whatever it is right um so after your carboy uh so you're gonna want to get uh in addition to your carboy you're gonna want to get a bung so this guy goes inside the hole so that you can then put your airlock um and all this is pretty cheap like uh you can definitely do stuff more um budget with again a balloon and a hole um but like an airlock cost you like a dollar uh, a bung cost you like 40 cents so it, it, it's not super price uh prohibitive it's um i i feel like there's just like a couple of things that are you know they're they're not expensive but they'll go a long way to improving the quality of your stuff yeah and and i think when we talk about like quality control um the, the the nice thing is that you can start doing it see if you like the process for a couple bucks not in terms of ingredients but like you can just be like hey i want to try making mead or beer or whatever mm -hmm. and you make it and it costs you 30 bucks 40 bucks but you're paying for that opportunity to just see like do i want to do this again because mm -hmm. like especially not so much with wine but like beer like there's a lot of like essentially like making soup like you're you're yeah. making like a three hour soup and like someone might say you know what? i don't like cooking so why mm -hmm. am i making soup for three hours and like watching the temperature and then dropping the temperature and doing all these different things like that might not be of interest to you once you like go and actually do it uh you know the the illusion of making beer is much different than um what it actually is mm -hmm. No, I, I, I agree. I personally, I've never actually made a beer. Um, the idea of like building a, a grain billet and cooking your wort and whatnot, that, that all was very intimidating for me. Um, it's That's always where the kits are really nice. Yeah, no, I agree. Like, I, I, I worked in a brew store, so it's like I, I helped people build their grain builds, but um, I never really got into like uh, like making beer because it's, it's also something i'm not super interested in personally like i'd rather have cider personally yeah yeah that's um, a whole other road <laughs> oh yeah no uh, yeah, it's it's not actually that different from like wine and mead so no no nice no thing. yeah um like the profiling from the different types of apples yeah can get no. uh, pretty interesting um yeah i um one of my early meads was an apple mead and so or a um a sizer. and uh, that one was really really fun because i i wanted to try and build something that didn't i didn't have to add acids to so instead of like adding tartaric acid or citric acid or malic acid you know the the, the normal wine acids that i'll get further into later um i used different apples so i would use like uh lots of granny smiths or green apples or crab apples to really impart like that natural um acid into it to help balance it all out and it was it was it was a fun fun little experiment and uh if if we get apples again in flagstaff i'll definitely be doing it again yeah yeah so um to, i guess to circle back to the main point so 
basically you've got three major components you've got your thing that the liquid's going in Mm -hmm. you've got the the stopper which uh connects it to whatever you're using to bubble it off the Mm -hmm. the gases from the fermentation process and you can go as simple like you said like uh you can actually go and buy a carboy or if you are not a carboy a um airlock or you can like if you have a hose that fits into the thing perfectly mm-hmm. yeah you no, shove a um, piece of plastic in there and stick the other end in a bucket of water exactly yeah that's the diy kind of airlock system and it works it's it, it, it's not like it i mean the there's a really cool so the romans actually when they were doing like wine and mead they just put like a layer of olive oil on top and that would be enough that's of awesome. a barrier for so, you know it's funny though like you think that's like kind of doing things like kind of like cheap or ghetto or whatever, like being like, mm-hmm. I'm going to use this, this, uh, hose, but like no, it's when I, resourceful. It, it's resourceful, but also, uh, to go back to my buddy, that was a sales manager. I used to help out once in a while in the cellar and like they're big, big, you know, they're making, uh, what was it five BBLs or whatever, like yeah. these giant tanks that are, you know, 20 feet tall. And they've got this hose that's like eight inches wide that they're doing the same thing in a five gallon buckets because like that's the only way to like air them off appropriately mm-hmm. and like not explode everything so it's like it comes full circle yeah no i agree um there that's the nice thing about winemaking or just fermentation in general you can you can take it as seriously or as um kind of i don't know what the word to use for that one would be uh i guess casual. casually yeah. yeah casually uh as you want like if you want to really get deep into it, like get deep into the science of it, you can totally do that. Like, uh, I mean, I, I, I have like a small lab at home, uh, so I can do my little tests on what's going on with my mead. Um, but I know people who never get a pH from their mead or, uh, they feed all their nutrients, um, kind of on a schedule instead of like getting, uh, raw numbers and, and, doing their schedule based on those numbers so it's all about what you want to do it's very personal uh very customizable it's, it's very uh you you can really um use it to express yourself i guess yeah and especially it's cool when you have like ingredients from home that you can use so mm-hmm. um like if uh, a couple of years ago i i did a, a blueberry beer this is like this is my old house so this was like seven years ago mm-hmm. i'd made a, a blueberry ipa just because and uh, i had like a bunch of blueberries i didn't know what to do with so i was like all right i'm making a blueberry ipa why not see what happens uh, it wasn't really good but it was just still cool to be like i made this it grew like part of it grew like right over there mm-hmm. um and, and it's you know it's a fun hobby uh and also like i think it's it's very fundamental to like what humans have done for a long time so mm-hmm. like it's it's it scratches that itch of like being human yeah no i agree it's um one of my favorite ones that I did was uh, two year and a half ago, two years ago, I made a prickly pear mead where I went down, harvested all the prickly pears by hand, crushed them up, got little thorns all over the place, um, turned it to juice, and it was this beautiful magenta. It tasted so nice. It was floral. It was fruity. It was slightly tart. Um and then in combination with uh, the desert wildflower honey, it just, it was this beautiful bouquet of, of, of flavor. Um, so no, I, I, I definitely agree that, uh, by kind of, uh, bringing your local environment, bringing, you know, your region into what you're making is definitely a, a very satisfying, um, way of expressing yourself through your through your craft yeah so um so i think most people understand like basic the basic fundamentals of how like wine or any alcohol is made it's like there's sugars Mm -hmm. yeast get to the sugars the byproduct is gas and the other byproduct is alcohol Mm -hmm. eventually they die because there's too much alcohol and Mm -hmm. now you have this delicious beverage yeah you have Uh, a dizzy drink yeah (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so uh could you talk a little bit uh maybe in a little bit more detail about that or like what what um people should know that's going on that might may, may uh, sure. Im- impact the flavor and things like that so um 
the, the, the actual process that we're going through is we're putting yeast through what's called anaerobic respiration or anaerobic, res yeah, anaerobic respiration. Um, so what that means is you are uh, putting yeast in an environment that does not have oxygen. So you're uh, making it kind of switch its gears to uh, convert sugar into CO2 and alcohol as the, the, the waste byproducts in order to produce energy. And uh, yeast will do that until one of several things happens. Either uh, it can't reproduce anymore because there's no more building blocks. Like there's no more amino acids, the, the proteins that the, that the yeast needs to keep on uh, proliferating won't, be, it, it, they're not there anymore. Uh, you can kind of solve that by doing nutrient ads and whatnot. Um, it runs out of sugar so it'll just starve to death or it's uh in an environment that has too much alcohol and then it will just die because alcohol is waste and you can only survive in so much waste before you, you know you get sick and die um that's more or less what it is so it's just this it, it's the the conversion of sugar into energy with the byproduct of co2 and alcohol um yeah. The important thing when you're actually going through this, uh, that was kind of something that I made the mistake of in my early batches is temperature control. So uh, when you look at uh, a yeast chart, which is like, so let's say like Lalvin or Red Star, whatever like brand um, yeast they do, they'll have like a, a kind of a text sheet that goes through all of the conditions and and kind of ranges so like what's the new uh, what's the nitrogen uh need for this what's the speed of the fermentation how what's the alcohol range what's the temperature range um those are all kind of just giving you the idea of this these are the conditions that this yeast needs to survive and proliferate uh the thing i made the issue of uh, the error of is my first batch is i didn't temperature control so i was fermenting in my closet uh, and, uh, the, the closet, it was, it, it was, yeah, no, it was too warm. It was the middle of summer. I was easily hitting like 85 degrees in my closet. And, uh, so that does that, that what ends up happening is the yeast stops producing ethyl alcohol. And in addition produces other types of alcohol that aren't as great. Um, those are the ones that can kind of make you go blind. However, the chances of you like getting sick off of homebrew is kind of rare, um, but it is feasible if like you really mess it up. But for the most part, people won't drink the stuff because it just tastes bad. So um, theoretically, you could definitely like get sick or 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 you know something along those lines if you were able to stomach a couple bottles, but yeah yeah okay so um it's basically a, a you have like a matrix of like the sugars the yeasts the temperature mm -hmm. and all those boil out or not boil um but funnel out in like the fermentation process to um where the yeast eventually stops continuing to digest sugar for right. whatever reason right and it's at that point you start thinking about uh, like secondary racking and um thinking about like separating anything that's settled to the bottom clarification all that kind of stuff right so um when you let me get back to my notes <laughs> sorry sorry no no you're good um because there was a point that i wanted to bring up um finding no racking. That's what it was. Um, so no, it's nutrient desert. That's what I wanted to go over. <laughs> Sorry. Um, when you make a, uh, any kind of alcohol, uh, what you're doing is you are creating a median or a medium that uh, microbes can survive in. Uh, the way that we kind of minimize that in the wine industry is um, so first off, our pH, uh, the pH range that we normally go for for wines, and this includes meat as well, is about 2.9 to 3.9, 3.8. Somewhere around there. 
Uh, and what this is, is this is just a, a really harsh acid that most microbes can't survive in. You're basically um, raking vinegar. I mean, eh, not really. Uh, so, okay, kind of. Uh, vinegar is the is the process of of oxygen interacting with alcohol. It yeah, well, I meant like in terms of like pH. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because it's like three and a half. I think is considered like vinegar technically. Right. Yeah. So um, it, it it it's a pretty similar process to make uh, vinegar. I've never made it, but uh, I have a got cursory right over there. <laughs> nice. I have a pretty cursory uh, understanding of it. Um, so what you do is you get it down to that pH so that most microbes can't survive in it. Um, now, enology yeast, winemaking yeast, or brewer's yeast, um, these are all things that uh, have been genetically selected to be very uh, efficient, very competitive. Uh, so for the most part, wine yeast, brewer's yeast will outcompete most microbes in this kind of solution. Um, kind of like the way that like honeybees will outcompete like native pollinators uh, in an area like European honeybees. Um, the other thing, so microbes will eat the sugar if, if they get the opportunity to. So we try and keep the pH low. We try and introduce something that will outcompete those things. Um, but there's two things in uh, wine and, and mead, mostly wine, um, that microbes can eat so there's sugar and then there's malic acid and so have you ever gone to like the the wine section at the grocery store and you see like chardonnay that says like buttery or creamy yeah. so those are wines that underwent what's called malolactic fermentation uh what it is is we add a bacteria that converts malic acid into lactic acid uh, there are other malolactic bacteria that will uh, convert those uh, malic acid into other compounds. Uh, but what ends up happening is it's kind of like a wine fault. It's uh, you, you, these bacteria can get in there and they'll change the mouthfeel. They'll change the taste. Uh, you'll have things like kind of ropiness, uh, sliminess, stickiness, uh, just bad flavoring. Uh, just these weird things that uh, this bacteria can get into. So in addition to fermenting all your sugar out so that you don't have anything for the microbes to survive in, uh, producing a bunch of alcohol so that microbes can't survive in, you can also remove malic acid and convert it into lactic acid. So then there's no more... Uh, there, there's no more uh, food for microbes to eat. Does that make sense? That, 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 yeah, that's yeah, what, yeah, that's that what's uh, that's what's called uh, secondary fermentation. Yeah, I've never really thought about alternative uh, things fermenting um, in terms of like in, in a meaning like an intense intended intent way. Mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not sure what the term a tense I should be using there is, but yeah, uh, that's an interesting. Uh, way to kind of layer the the fermentation like that mm -hmm. uh and it's not something i i, I know in some beers there you'll do like separate batches and then blend them after but mm -hmm. that doesn't sound like that's what you're doing here no so it's almost like you're 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 staging multiple fermentations so uh what we were normally doing was when the initial fermentation where the yeast is just converting sugar to alcohol the before that gets down to zero bricks, uh, bricks is a, a measure of uh, sugar in, uh, in water. Um, before that hits zero, which would be end of fermentation, it's done. We would throw our malolactic ferment or our malolactic uh, bacteria in, uh, and we would also kind of stir up the lees because uh, that bacteria can use the husks from the dead yeast to kind of use as building blocks and as, as food. Uh, and so then they can go through and complete their, uh, their uh, fermentation. And so this is gotcha. all just to try and uh, achieve what's called a, a nutrient desert. So you don't want anything that microbes can eat. Gotcha. So someone asked, um, is this 
process uh the bacterial issue rather not the the secondary fermentation uh similar to like an accidental inf infection of lactobacillus which makes like a sour beer yeah so lactobacillus is um is a type of uh malolactic bacteria it, 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 yeah. it's the same kind of thing um and yeah so uh beer makers like it because it makes sour beers wine makers hate it because it makes sour wine it's garbage um and we, there's another one uh there's a, a a yeast called uh bretomyces and this will make uh what it makes like it makes the same kind of like slimy Very, ropey yeah sorry i was gonna say yeah it's uh bretomyces is used in a lot of like uh not necessarily sour, but sour adjacent beers. Right. Yeah. And so, um, Bretomyces is really hard to get rid of, um, in wineries. Basically, if you have a Brett infection, you, the joke is you burn down the building because you can't really get rid of it. Uh, Sell it, it to a brewer, to a beer brewer. Yeah. Or you, you like, <laughs> if you have a, if you have a barrel that has Bretomyces in it, you sell it to a brewer. Um, you can't do anything with it. Uh, I know that there's mead makers out there who are trying to experiment because mead is this weird fusion of like uh, homebrew and breweries and winemakers. And I feel like it's more correct for it to be a wine, but there's a lot of the influence from like beer makers where they're trying to do weird and creative things with it, which is fine. I, I mean, that's how you kind of experiment and find out what works. Yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, I, I think we've covered the, the fermentation process. What else did you want to talk about in terms of the, the production? So, um, when it comes to like racking, uh, this is one, this is a problem that I had early on. I didn't know about racking until like probably like my second or third batch. Uh, which Could you is, uh, describe it? So uh, actually, I have a racking cane. Uh, basically what it is, it's a siphon. Uh, I like the auto siphons personally. You can do it without an auto siphon and just use gravity. Uh, an auto siphon is just so much easier. And it's just a little pump that uh, that takes the water, uh, that takes the wine in and uh, establishes uh, a siphon through a hose. Um, and what you're doing is you are what's called racking, taking stuff off and putting it somewhere else. Uh, racking lees, which are dead yeast, uh, any kind of solids from your uh, winemaking process, fruit flesh, uh, skins, just random stuff in the juice, uh, random stuff in the honey. Uh, you take all that off of your, off your, your alcohol and put it into a clean container. So you'd be taking it from like your bucket to your uh, carboy. And uh, you're left with basically the sludge at the bottom. And so this is just you kind of giving your wine an opportunity to clear itself up. This is, uh, so what you'll do is you'll kind of let time and gravity drop things out of suspension and uh, it'll kind of settle down at the bottom. You take the, the clean wine off and you clean out the, the dredge at the bottom. Uh, the big issue I had with it was I was really scared about my loss. So because I only had one gallon batches to begin with, I wanted to try and save as much as I could. And what that ended up meaning is I saved a lot of leaves and kept on racking the, the bad stuff over to the, to the new containers. And uh, when I actually went to bottle, there was probably about mm, like a 10th of the beer bottle full of just like gunk and. Oh, wow gross that's stuff the, yeah no like my first my first batches were bad like i i will i will happily admit to i did not know what i was doing when i first started off um but you know six seven years that's really kind of changed how i understand how to make alcohol and uh i think i'm doing pretty okay so far awesome uh so um so we we rack it and sometimes you do a secondary rack so same thing mm -hmm. just again yeah uh and then you get ready for bottling and then uh could you talk a little bit about a little bit about the bottling process 
So before you get to bottling, um, because once you bottle it, that's it. That you you're you're done. Uh, you've done all the corrections that you want to do. Uh, an important thing before you bottle is fining. Uh, fining is just the the process of um, kind of cleaning up your mead or your wine. Uh, so there's a lot of fining agents out there to address different issues. And and the the, the gist of it is basically. Um, the finding agents are either a positively or, uh, or negatively charged uh, molecule, and they'll target different things in your in your alcohol. So uh, in mead, a, a common issue is what's called protein haze. And so this is like you leave your mead, you keep racking it, uh, and you 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 have this haze that just won't go away, and it won't drop out of suspension. If you don't know what's going on with it, chances are it's protein haze. Just because you've introduced life into it, there's you know little microbes doing its thing. Uh, you're introducing protein. There's also protein in the honey a little bit. Uh, so it's just this this kind of compound that won't settle out. So what you do is you introduce another compound in there to bind to it and drop it out of suspension. Uh, the like go to for mead makers, everyone loves bentonite. Um, bentonite is a, like, a, a kind of a clay. Um, and so what it does is it just binds to those proteins, drops them out of solution. It's super quick. Like it's a, it's a 24 hour kind of thing. And then you just rack it off one more time and you're good. You got crystal clear mead. Um, there's a lot of different finding agents, uh, and they all do different things and they all have different effectiveness. Um, when we were doing stuff for school, uh, we would do like fining trials where we would get a bottle of uh, we'd fill a full bottle of wine for every fining method that we were going to do. So if we needed to do betonite, we'd do betonite. If we were going to do uh, gelatin, if we were going to do silica gel, if we were going to do uh, egg whites, casein, uh, we would just have this, this kind of range of stuff. And this is a little bit uh, less than feasible for, uh, someone doing it at home, we had, you know, a couple hundred gallons of wine. What, what would it matter if we bottled six bottles and did some finding trials on it? Uh, it's a little bit different when you only have, you know, at most 10 gallons. And that's like, that's like a fifth of your production right there on just like a finding trial. Yeah. Um, so you'll you'll go through and you'll kind of do your finding or your, your finding or whatever final adjustments uh if maybe you taste it and you think oh it needs a little bit of acid this is where you would add acid and you can do a couple of things with acid you could do uh like i said tartaric acid which is the primary acid found in grapes you could do citric acid which is a pretty universally common uh acid in everything it's in honey it's in apples it's in every just it's in everywhere uh you could do malic acid but like i said malic acid is a food source for other bacteria so you don't necessarily want to add that because you you know you're giving uh, an opening to other um microbes that you don't necessarily want um you could do lemon juice you could you could do you know apples like you can find more, I guess, natural sources of, of acid that aren't uh, like a refined kind of lab created acid. Uh, and then if you wanted to do anything like oaking, so you can get like oak chips, you can get uh, wood staves that you can just shove into your carboy, uh, let it sit for a couple months and, you know, impart some, some flavor on there. Uh, there's a lot of things you could do um, spices, herbs, uh, hops, there, there, there's a lot of things that you can kind of do before you go to bottle. But once you put it in the bottle, it's done. Uh, unless you want to open all your bottles and pour it right back into the carboy, which, yeah, that's not fun. Um, there are wineries that have to do that, where they have to take all their bottles and dump it back into the giant uh, fermentation vessel. And it's just it's so labor intensive and it's just not fun to do. So before you commit to bottling, make sure that it tastes good. Make sure it's ready to be bottled. Um, once you're done, you can do things like filtration. Uh, I have a what's called a all-in-one wine pump. 
it was like a hundred dollar thing. This is just me kind of making an investment into my craft. Uh, it's definitely not something that you need if you're starting from like zero. Uh, you could do things like running it through a coffee filter. Uh, it's not super great, but you could do it. Um, the all-in-one wine pump, it, uh, it's a vacuum pump that has a like, a like a water filter and you just get the the little like cylinder water filter uh, uh, filters, and uh, you run your wine through it, and it'll clean it up, and it will like it. It makes it presentable. It's a, it's an extra kind of fining refining step. Uh, once you are so ready, it's a to wine bottle, Brita filter. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's a wine Brita filter. Um, once you are good to go, uh, determine what you want to actually put it in. Uh, I know people who put it in beer bottles. I put it in wine bottles. Uh, there are people like there's uh, commercial winer or commercial meteries that do flip tops. Uh, it's all about what you want to do with it. So if you're going to basically drink it immediately, if, you, if, it, if it's not going to last. So about 90% of all wine is consumed immediately, which is within like three years of it being bottled. Uh, so about 10% of it actually gets cellared and aged. Uh, if you want to actually cellar it and age it, put it in wine bottles, put it in wine bottles, put corks on it. Cause that's going to be the best method to age it. If you want to drink it within the first two years, flip tops, beer bottles, whatever you, whatever you feel comfortable with, uh, flip tops are easy because you don't really need to get any additional equipment. Uh, it's basically you use your you can use your uh, your siphon to just siphon from your carboy straight to a bottle and then uh, you know pull the pull the hose out plug it so that you don't uh, spray it all over your kitchen like I did and uh, you know just keep on bottling uh, if you if you've already done like beer making uh, you and you maybe have uh, like a capper you could do beer bottles and stuff. Yeah, you do the bombers. They're basically yeah, wine so, bottles. <laughs> so the the issue with like so the issue that people have when it comes to like bottles exploding is because they're not doing what's called degassing, because the yeast is producing CO2 in pretty significant quantities, what ends up happening is uh, a lot of CO2 gets trapped in solution. So it's kind of uh, I think it's aqueous is the correct term for it. Uh, and so when you go through a bracket, what you're doing is you're agitating your wine and you're allowing for that CO2 to come out. Now, when you do that, you have this kind of catch 22 one, it's going to get the CO2 out. So you don't have any issue with, uh, bottle exploding or anything like that. But by removing the CO2 from your liquid, you are allowing like oxygen to get in. So once you're done fermenting, that's where you gotta be really careful about keeping oxygen off of it. Yeah. And so the, the rule of thumb that we had, at least for the winery is that a white wine, which I would consider a mead, a white wine, uh, is only allowed five moves. And so a move is a rack or moving from uh, storage container to bottling. Uh, after you start doing more than five moves, you start introducing oxygen into it. It'll oxidize and it'll kind of brick itself. It's not super great. Uh, there are things that you can do where uh, there are fining agents that are used to kind of strip out that oxidized uh, flavoring. Uh, it is... Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. I think it's casein is the one, uh, which is, you know, milk protein, um, that will strip out oxidation. Uh, but if you use too much, you start stripping out flavor and, you know, it's, so it's, it's all about being careful when you do things like fin finding always add less and then just keep on doing it instead of going really, uh, really strong and like or going really heavy handed at first and then yeah. stripping out all your tasty flavor.
Yeah, and I'll clarify. Um, when I said bombers, I meant like the oversized beer bottles. Like, oh this. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like but yeah, Belgium. also beer bombs. Like that's also yeah. a thing. No, <laughs> or I'm sorry. Bombs. Yes. I was like trying no. to find one because all the ones I have here are like different. Uh, like the, all the other ones like aren't like clearly a bomber. So mm -hmm. I was like, oh, what am I gonna show them? So got some old stuff too. This is a 2013 bottle. Stout. <sighs> might be. Yeah, I guess stout. 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 Stout will hold for uh, <laughs> for a couple of years. Yes, I mean, I, I when again, my a friend of mine was uh, very involved in the craft brewery industry for a while, and we'd get to these like exclusive tastings of like these beers that are like 10, 15 years old. So, I don't think I've ever had one older than fifteen years. But like this, that one I was just showing you is nine years old. So that might be just about time to crack open. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. Um, so for wine, uh, I was really lucky with my school. Uh, so in addition to winemaking, we also took courses on like sensory evaluation and history of wine. And uh, one of the things that we did every class is we drank wine. So we were a wet campus uh, and we had people who were bringing it. So I was probably like one of, if not the youngest person in my class. I think the average age is somewhere around like 50. Uh, so I was way just, I was, a I was, I was a black sheep there, but, uh, we had people who were bringing in like, oh, this is a, like a 74 from my cellar. And it's all like, all right, I'll try it. Yeah. Right. It, you know, a lot of it was good. A lot of it was, you know, definitely over the hill. And so, uh, aging is a completely different thing. Like there's the unfortunate thing is like me doesn't have enough, uh, kind of science behind it. So like, there's not, there's no one really championing, uh, for, for mead. So nobody's putting research into how long can it age? What happens when it ages? Uh, just because it's, it, it's kind of a novelty still. Yeah. Uh, so I, I do want to address some of the questions people are bringing sure. up. Um, so someone said I made a honeysuckle mead at the beginning of the pandemic. I forgot about it and just found it in a cool area of my basement two years later. What are the chances it will kill me if I drink it? So I think the, the big question is, uh, was it bottled or was it in a carboy? Did the, did the airlock dry out? Because if the airlock dries out, then your alcohol is going to start being turned into vinegar. And uh, it probably won't kill you, but it probably won't be tasting super great. Um, I guess the rule of thumb is uh smell it like smell it first make sure it doesn't smell bad like if it, it, it like do kind of like how you would with like a like uh an unknown berry like do, go through the steps like you know rub it on a piece of like you know go through go through the the motions to make sure it's safe uh don't drink a whole bit uh, a whole bunch of it drink like a little tiny sip don't swallow it just put it in your mouth and you know does it taste foul uh, if it does spit it out, it's, it's bad. Um, but, but if it doesn't, know, it's probably good. Yeah. If it doesn't, then you're great. Like yeah. you're, 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 you're probably fine. Um, again, like when I made my first batches that were like turpentine, basically, uh, you knew that it tasted bad as soon as it hit your tongue and you just spit that stuff out. Um, yeah. someone also asked, uh, I've got five pounds of blueberries that are a little too ripe to eat. They have two clean growlers, a couple of airlocks, and some champagne yeast. Uh, if I want to make some blueberry wine, what should I do? Okay, so when you go to do a blueberry wine like that, uh, what I would recommend is you puree the blueberries down. So a lot of people, especially like mead makers, they have a tendency of just adding whole fruit to a bunch of mead, and then they get upset when there's uh when there's no fruit being imparted uh by you turning it into a puree you're going to give it more surface area to work with uh the issue is is that okay so five pounds isn't that much uh i would probably say instead of doing a wine maybe try a mead because uh, what you're going to end up doing with a wine anyways is, I don't know the, the actual sugar content of blueberries off the top of my head, but with apples, if we're doing an apple wine, we end up adding a ton of sugar. 
because we want to get the alcohol up to like at least 11 or 12 percent but uh apples will naturally go somewhere around like four to six you know cider cider is 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 uh basically just raw apple juice that gets fermented so if you want to make an apple wine you need to add more sugar in that's called chapitalization uh now if you do a mead instead, what you do is instead of adding table sugar, you're adding honey. And so you can do things like you could get blueberry honey that will kind of complement your uh, your blueberries. And uh, if you puree it and have a, a lot of surface area for that flavor to come out of the blueberries, when you undergo, when you undertake your, your fermentation process, all of the kind of pulp will come down out of solution and you can just rack it off but you'll have a really really tasty mead after uh, after it's done uh and the you other want thing to puree those right yes uh, i would definitely puree uh i uh so i do uh, i have a, a press like a small little basket press and a uh, little like grinder uh so again this is me doing things a little bit more professionally because I've been doing it for so long that I can actually justify me buying equipment. Uh, but I mean, you could just throw it in a blender, throw it in the blender uh, or like a little Nutribullet or something, if you got one of those, uh, and then just add everything. So add the, add the flesh, add the, uh, add the juice. Um, you could even do a pectin enzyme to help increase your juice yield. Uh, so if you do, uh, your blueberries, pectin enzyme on top. Uh, I know you can use, I think uh, pectin enzyme is used in jelly or jam, one of the two. Yeah. Um, and that's, again, it's, it's the same kind of concept. Uh, we use pectin to increase our yields because it you know, helps get the juices out. Um, and uh, the more juice you get out, the a lot of the flavor is in the skins, it's in the flesh, it's in the juice. So the more of those things that you can get out and into your mead, the more flavorful your stuff is going to be. Um, so, yeah, I think we got them all. Yeah, just double checking. Uh, it looks like he had another question just asking about the blueberries whole. So yeah, just puree them. Uh, don't add them whole because it's just, you're, you're not going to be able to get those flavors out. Yeah, you're not going to get the full value of the blueberries. Yeah, no, again, that was something that I made the mistake of on my first one, my first uh, meads were uh, a blueberry, a strawberry, and a pomegranate mead. And none of them tasted like blueberries, strawberries, or pomegranates because I I, I, I just added full fruit. So, yeah. All right. So we've, I think we've covered basically all the fundamentals at this point um, of making alcohol whether it's wine or meat or even basically beer for the most part. Mm -hmm. uh, anything else you wanted to cover that we didn't? So uh, I think I have two small things. Uh, so the first one's like choosing your ingredients, I guess. Uh, so in terms of yeast, uh, you can definitely use like bread yeast, like uh, from, you know, your grocery store. Uh, the thing about like bread yeast is that it's not designed to ferment it's designed to make bread so you don't have a clean uh alcohol tolerance it might stall out uh it so stalling out is when it just stops working without reaching the alcohol limit or without reaching the or without completely eating all the sugar uh when that happens, I use champagne yeast. Champagne yeast is kind of like a workhorse for yeast. It will, uh, it's what we use to stop uh, to restart fermentations if it stalls. And you can you you you'll find that out by using a uh, hydrometer to kind of like monitor where your alcohol is going at the moment. Uh, that's again uh, measures your sugar in solution and how it's progressing. So um, I use bricks as the the measure because it's easy um and so a uh, wine will usually be somewhere around like 22 to like 28 bricks um and 
uh, you can monitor how your fermentation is going based on how many bricks it changes every day. Uh, the general rule of thumb is you don't want to let your wine go faster than like one, one and a half, two bricks a day, uh, because if it goes too hot, then you kind of like cook off your flavors, um, by letting it go slow, uh, kind of like stewing almost all those flavors are kept in and they kind of develop slower and more, um, complex, like it's more complex. Yeah. Yeah. I think of it like at each stage has different flavors. So the longer it's at each stage of like how, for how fermented it is, the more layers you're adding to it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that like is actually what's happening, but that's the way I've always thought about it. And someone also asked, do either of you have any insight into alternate fermentables, forage things, surprise foods with high sugars? Uh, I've heard of some weird stuff, but you seem like the people to ask. Uh, I'll let okay. you take that first. Yes. Okay. So this is really fun. So um, I compete in a competition at my school called Emer the Emerging Winemakers Competition. Uh, in the first year that we, we hosted it, the wine that won was a tomato wine i've had tomato wine yeah no and so it, it's like it, so there's a bunch of really basically anything that has sugar in it you can ferment um i have this little uh winemaking handbook it's just like a little cheap um like five ten dollar book but it has all these weird recipes and um some of the ones uh there's parsnip there's like rhubarb wine is a big one that is like very sweet, but also yep. not what you might think of. Uh, there's corn wine. There's um, uh, corn wine is basically whiskey's baby brother. Yeah, it's 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 like pre it's the mash <laughs> pre pre whiskey. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, one of the really interesting ones is uh, oh, what is it? It's um, it's made from sap. Oh, like a maple uh, a birch no 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 so so you see so, uh birch birch wine that's what it is um i have to have my maple trees next week so nice that might be on my agenda yeah no uh, um one of my classmates actually made a uh acer glen i think is what it's called where it's a, a maple mead and that was, was really tasty yeah i've been thinking about maple uh like using maple for as a sugar for like a wine or a meat or a cordial or something. Mm -hmm. um, and it just never occurred to me to like actually do it. Uh, but somebody mentioned dandelion. I actually have some dandelion wine in my fridge um, from last year. So that mm -hmm. might be starting to turn because it's in a glass bottle with like a pop lid, like a not a cork, but like the plastic yeah, like... with a rubber grommet. Mm -hmm. uh, that's like sitting in the back corner of my fridge now for like six, eight months. So I might have to go check that tonight. <laughs> yeah, just give give it give a good smell. Yeah, uh, yeah. As far as birch beer, so there is birch beer, which is like root beer, and then there's mm -hmm. like birch, like you're taking the sap and like fermenting it. Yeah, so the birch wine. Uh, I think if I remember right, it's like Scandinavian. Probably. Um, I, I'm pretty sure it's somewhere Nordic. Yeah, exactly. I the, I, I think of it like uh, kind of on the same like Viking lines um yeah and so i don't remember the process because i've never been able to get any kind of sizable amount of birch sap to actually you know do it's that hard process. to find and it doesn't stay as well as like maple syrup yeah uh so i'm not totally surprised and i, I have smaller birch trees so i don't get a ton out of it i could maybe pull off like a half gallon batch well, um, and see, th this is what i'm wondering is i wonder if it's if it undergoes a similar process to like how you convert uh maple sap into maple syrup where you have to kind of cook it. Yeah. Um, so that's, so like when, uh, so what, wait, what do you mean? Do you mean like, do you have to do that before the, or could you use the like raw? Birch no, no, no. Or... So, so uh, I'm, I'm thinking birch sap goes to birch syrup kind of thing. Yeah. So like that's, yeah. that's what you do. Like you boil it down just like you do with maple syrup. Mm -hmm. um, but the ratio is higher. So like if you typically need 50 gallons of uh, maple water to make a gallon of maple syrup, it's like 100, 150 gallons of birch water to make a gallon of birch syrup. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, someone asked to see the book again. I don't know if you could uh, so show us and I read it for us. I actually have a ton of books. So um, the, <laughs> the one book uh, is the Winemaker's Recipe Handbook. It's a, like I said, it's a little tiny one. It, uh, it has um, 100 recipes or 101 recipes, sorry. Uh, and it's a bunch of just random stuff like onion wine and uh, just really weird things. Um, in addition to this, uh, I also have, um, this was actually my textbook in, in college. Uh, and you know, it's a good textbook if you keep on reading it, even after you graduated. Uh, it is concept, uh, third edition concepts in wine technology, small winery operations. Um, it's a, it's a pretty cheap book. I think it's like 25 or 30 bucks. And it goes really heavy into, into the science in some of these parts. Uh, so don't get super bogged down in the science there. Uh, like it'll talk about, uh, this is the molecular weight and this is how it interacts. And this is, this is how you, uh, draw it out for like the organic chemistry, uh, thing. Uh, in addition, I have another textbook, um, wine, a tasting course, uh, every one, uh, every glass in a glass. Um, and so that was my sensory evaluation book. And that kind of teaches you how to analyze what you're drinking. Uh, that was one of the hardest things. So I started my school when I was 21. Uh, so I didn't have an opportunity to really like party, I guess. Uh, I, basically had to fast track my palate for wine, uh, like immediately. Uh, cause I was, you know, I was going to class and I was drinking wine. I'm like, I can't, I can't taste anything past the alcohol. I'm, 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 I'm a little babby. And so, uh, I, it took a while, but I sat down really like focused on how to taste and this book helps a lot. So if it's something that like you want to kind of learn how to, analyze wine more than just like drink it uh that's definitely a good one to go for and i think that's again like another 20 or 30 dollar book um and i mean you can probably find pdfs of it yeah so i'm uh, not sci hub um what the hell is that website b-ok.cc uh, you can basically find every single book up there if you look mm -hmm. um if you haven't checked that out before you didn't hear about it here but it nope. exists google will not show it to you um, if you try to Google it, because it'll be like, nope, that website is not accepted by Google. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you want to go find it, b-ok.cc. Uh, and that's O as in the letter O and K as in the letter K, not OK, like the word. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so this has been cool. Uh, I, I always have been into winemaking and fermentation in general. Uh, so it's cool to hear it from somebody who actually like got graded on their knowledge of it. To... Yeah, no, I like I, I um, so one of the nice things about my school, because it's a learning college, uh, we basically had a fully operational winery, the the Southwest Wine Center, which if you just look up Southwest Wine Center dot com, that's that's my school. Uh, it, so all the students helped kind of make the wine. And so uh, we were allowed to do a lot of really weird and creative things. I the the year that I was there was the first year that we made a mead. Because uh, the I, you know I, I told the teacher I'm a mead maker I'm here for I'm here for mead and he was interested and he's like all right let's make a mead in the spring because there's nothing to ferment in the spring everything's in barrel we have a bunch of empty fermentation vessels let's make let's make a barrel of it and just see what happens and we made this like it's called a, a mora it's a mulberry mead oh, and it was uh, awesome. really like. The, the descriptors that we got from people was like kind of like carnival -y. I want to know what it, how, like one of the really interesting things about fermentation and if people are into like kimchi or like any fermented product, that's not like something that they, like the thing with like beer is like, you know what, like you, you can kind of taste the bread flavors in beer, but you don't, you don't like, oh, this is exactly like a, a, a liquid version of bread. And like with, foods that you eat whole consistently like grapes or apples or mm -hmm. um like it, you're talking about like mulberries the flavors never really translate the same way so now I, I need to know what mulberry 
fermented taste like? It's it's and it's, what kind of mulberries were you using? Were they red or black or white or? So I actually don't know. Uh, we got we got mulberry concentrate. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to back sweeten uh, with mulberries and. Uh, this is a big reason why I don't make sweet mead. I only make dry mead because uh, in order for you to make sweet mead, you need to have uh, a sterile environment for you to do it, or it, you run the risk of like, you know, stuff exploding or secondary fermentation or, or not necessarily second, like a restarted fermentation. I should yeah, say. You're, you're basically setting up a honey pot. Like, yeah, literally. exactly. <laughs> like you're, for yeast it, or bacteria. It, 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 it's a little, a uh, little IED almost. Yeah. Um, and so what ended up happening is we added the we added the syrup or, or the juice or whatever it was. I think it was a concentrate that they ended up getting uh, to the 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 the, the fermentation uh, fermentation vessel, um, and then we ran it through a 0.45 micron filter, which is a, a sterile filter, and we thought that that would be good enough and what ended up happening is uh we made our first sparkling mead <laughs> Ooh, a little fermentation a little bit of fermentation and now here's the nice thing is that not a whole lot of the bottles exploded so because it's stored in a cool cellar it slowed down the process of fermentation so it wasn't like if i left a bottle of it in my car it would probably explode in my car but because it was being kept in a cold cellar, it was it was able to ferment just a little bit. So just a little bit of, of carbonation. And that's also kind of why people were like, oh, it's kind of carnival -y. It's kind of fun. It's, it's bubbly. Because um, everyone, people lose their shit over bubbly. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's an art form to be able to ferment things and do the secondary ferment to mm -hmm. pressurize it and not explode it. Yeah. Um, like beer My, is one thing, but like with a higher alcohol content, it's tough. Yeah. My, uh, my next kind of challenge that I want to do is I want to make a mead that does, uh, that uses the, the champagne method. So what that is, is I ferment it down, uh, and then I will immediately after it ferments, I'll bottle it. I'll put what's called a dosage, which is just like uh, juice or some kind of sugary syrup into each of the bottles. And then I put a beer cap on it. And then I put it in uh, what's called a riddling rack. It's kind of like a sandwich board that has holes in it. And you put all your bottles in with the necks kind of facing in. And you do what's called riddling, which is you go through and you turn the bottles every day, uh, just ever so slightly. So what ends up happening is all of the lees and all the gunk that you would normally rack off is now being is now sliding down to the neck of the bottle. And then what you do is you freeze the bottle. Like you you put the the bottle through uh, like a brine uh, and freeze it. So you freeze that yeast plug. You open it up and the carbonation that is in there because you added more sugar after it fermented will force that out. And then you go through and put an actual champagne cork on it. That's awesome. It's super, super time. Like, it, it seems it, like it, a really easy way to die. Like, I know you probably won't, but like describing it sounds like things are just going to come flying out and like you got to dodge it and then shove a cork back in it. Yeah. Nobody's died losing an eye. Yeah, not yet. Give, no, give me a chance at it. Someone right, will. Fair enough. Uh, so Aiden, this has been fantastic. Um, any final thoughts, anything you wanted to mention before we wrapped up? Um, no, I think uh, just if you're, if you're wanting to get into it, definitely look into finding your local brew store. So um, they're going to be a, a, a wealth of knowledge for if you have any issues, if you have any specific questions, they can definitely help you. These are people who are just as passionate, if not more passionate than I am about what we're doing, kind of getting into a craft, getting into a hobby. Uh, they'll help you kind of figure out what equipment you need, or uh, they'll answer your questions about like, Hey, my, my so-and-so doesn't taste super great. Well, go ahead and try adding this and then, you know, rack it off and see what happens. Yeah. Uh, depending where you are, sometimes they'll just be like, bring it in. We'll try it and tell you what's wrong with it. 
Yeah, no, like, and, and that, that's, that's the nice thing is that, um, you know, if you go enough times, you'll start building a rapport with them. They'll know you. You're the guy making the weird mead or you're the guy making the weird wine. And, uh, you know, you eventually, you know, start bringing them bottles and, you know, start exchanging stuff because chances are the guy who runs the place is also making, you know, a couple dozen gallons of, of beer or wine or cider or whatever. Uh, just because that's what they do for their hobby and they turned into a business. So, yeah. And uh, also definitely like, always... one of the, one of my favorite things about like craft alcohol in general is that like the point of it is to share it. Like you make it for yeah. yourself, but like you want to be like, Hey, try this thing I made. And like, that's like universal across political spectrums across everything. Mm -hmm. No, I, 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 I agree. I, I get a lot of, um, I have a lot of pride with, with what I make. Uh, and I always love sharing it. Like, it, it's just one of my favorite things. I like, I, I brought like a case of wine to work and just like gave a bunch of it to my coworkers because it's like, Hey, I, I, I make wine. Uh, I'm, I'm neat. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, uh, other point that I would like to bring up before we close is, um, when you go to get your stuff that you're going to put in, whatever you're going to ferment, uh, always go for quality. Uh, your meat is only, or your, your alcohol is only going to be as good as the raw ingredients that you put into it. So if you're going to go make a mead, uh, don't just get like honey, get, get, get a name yeah, honey. Walmart brand honey. Yeah. Yeah. Get, get, get something, go, go find a beekeeper, go find your local beekeeper and see what he has. He's going to have something really cool or she. They're going to have something really cool that's local to your area and that you can use that to kind of tell your story about like, this is my me, this is my wine. Uh, it came from my neighborhood. It came from my, my neck of the woods. Uh, it is uniquely me. Uh, yeah. You know, tell a story with your stuff. It, it, it's a craft like it, more than anything. Uh, be proud of it. Yeah. Aiden, thanks so much. Thank you so much. So, folks, hopefully you enjoyed that. If you did and you want to throw a couple bucks over to Aiden, uh, you can Venmo us at Poor Pearls Almanac because I forgot to ask him for his Venmo. Um, or you can hit us up on Cash App at the at dollar sign Poor Pearls, and uh, we'll get it over to him. Uh, outside of that, if you enjoyed this content, please help us um, pay our bills because posting stuff is expensive and that's why we can stream to multiple uh, sources. So some of you are watching on YouTube, some on Twitter, some on Facebook, uh, some on Twitch, and we can do that because we pay for services. So if you're enjoying this uh, and you're on Twitch, throw us a, a subscription if you can. If you can't, uh, you may have an Amazon Prime subscription that you can use that's free for you. Throw it over our way if you don't mind. Uh, additionally, you can support us on Patreon. Two bucks a month, seven cents a day helps us keep the lights on. Proverbially, uh, our lights won't actually turn on, won't actually turn off if you don't. Uh, but it would be nice to know that people care what we're doing. Gives you early access to our podcast as well. Uh, week early episodes, except for this week, it was a little bit late, and that's a long story. But uh, we did just recently drop for our patrons a new episode on the Eastern Agricultural Complex. So if you're interested in traditional food methods and uh, landscape management, go check it out. It's a really interesting episode. It'll be coming out Sunday night otherwise. Um, and that's that's pretty much it. If you're not familiar with the Poor Pearls Almanac, we are a podcast. We've been around for two years now. We've got about 80 episodes out there and a whole bunch of people following us on Facebook and uh, Instagram. So if you want, go hit us up on our socials. And uh, next, I think our next... Um, our next stream is going to be on uh, prepping for kids, I believe. So we'll be talking about how to talk about climate collapse with your kids if you have them and uh, making them well-adjusted and emotionally resilient in a really uncomfortable time. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this, and I'm sure I'll see a bunch of you next week. Thanks, guys.